Yeah, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, but moving right along, we have a presentation by Zach Moore and Ronnie Scherer from FRC Teams 503 and 3542 on adding additive manufacturing to your tool belt. Hello. All right, so. Ready, we are all set on my end, Zach, if you're ready. Awesome. So thanks to everybody putting this together. This is a pretty awesome uh, conference that we have going. I'm glad uh, we could be a part of it and hopefully we can uh, give you some extra information on how to get you guys started into additive manufacturing. So first we'll start off with a little bit of uh, who we are for you guys. Um, and then what is additive versus subtractive? Um, why should we use it? How does the industry use it? What are some good FRC uses? Um, and then a majority of the presentation will probably be spent in how can we get you guys started um, a basic understanding of your slicer settings and how to get you printing successfully in a few different materials. Um, and then some design considerations, some things you wanna watch out for, and then we'll finish off with Q&A. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick it off here. Uh, so my name is Ronnie Shear. I um, did mechanical engineering at Kettering University here in Michigan. Um, currently I'm an engineer at Azov 3D and run our production for the facility. Um, Co-founder of Design Flow with Zach. Um, FRC mentor on 3542 speed. It's out of Temperance, Michigan, then nine years in FRC. Yep, and I'm Zach, also went to Kettering University. I'm finishing up my systems engineering master's and a systems engineering certification through Penn State and MIT. Um, but 3D printing is kind of where we enjoy spending most of our time. So that's where design flow came into play. Um, spent the past uh, six years helping mentor an FRC and uh, really enjoying it. So I want to start off here. Um, what is additive manufacturing? Some people might be aware of, of stuff that's at home or, or desktop setting. Um, and then how does it compare to subtractive manufacturing? So it's, I'll put into subtractive manufacturing, it could even be a hand drill. You're using a standard drill bit um, to take material away from a piece of stock. Maybe it's a piece of one by one in FRC type of setting. It could be your CNC router that you use to do belly pans or even do uh, two by one tubing for frames. You have lays that you could use on your shafts. Knee mills, this would go under anything like a bridge port, stuff that maybe you're doing a, a custom hole pattern on, or maybe you have a proto track. Then a VMC, so anything that um, maybe you have a, a Haas mini mill at your school or somebody's upgraded um, to any type of vertical machine center um, that you use there. So I have a, a picture of subtractive to the right. Uh, these were drive rails that we did on speed, but this would be something that would fall under the subtractive manufacturing category. You have a uh, fixture or work holding to hold it down to the table. Then you would have a cutting tool um, in a holder or a collet that you would use to um, cut the material away from the billet piece. Under additive manufacturing, almost every form is going to be adding material, whether it's a powder-based, a solid state that came from pellets or liquid resin, or if it's a liquid that's infused with a solid. So some nanoparticle jetting would fall under this category. Um, but the basic concept is that material is added and it always happens on a build plate. That surface can change, but most of the time, once you print on that build plate, you take that part off. There's no part set up. There's no fixture set up. There's no um, time that you spent for soft jaws or something for that itself. These can be used in classrooms. So if you have a, maybe um, a teacher that oversees your program or you're a student and you have access to a um, a lab classroom. These can go off of standard 110 outlets, um, little noise, and once you start your print, there's really not an operator that has to stand by it like sometimes we have to have with subtracting manufacturing. So going over almost all forms of additive, you have metal, um, uh, sorry about that, material extrusion, plastic, composite, and metal. So plastic would fall under your PLAs, stuff that you see at home. Composite is more of the, the continuous strand fibers. So there's really two big players, Mark Forge and Desktop Metal. One does it with solid strand fiberglass and carbon fiber. The other one uses a tape composite. And so they use this with a, a roller and heat press and then material extrusion with metal. So this is something like Rapida that um, kind of uses a two-step process for metal. Um, powder bed fusion, 
I stuck multi-jet fusion, that's an HP kind of binder jet process, but you have SLS, which uses a laser with powder nylon, and then DMLS, which is a laser with metal. Then VAT polymerization, this is all the, the liquid resin printing that, that you would commonly see, SLA, CLIP, DLP, these will all fall under um, any VAT polymerization uh, process where it uses a laser or a light source of some sort with a liquid resin that, that cures these uh, photopolymers. Binder jetting for metal and sand. So this is going to be a, um, a, a liquid or, or chemical uh, fuse process that is going to deposit um, a chemical into a powder metal or powder plastic um, and have a reaction that, that, that fuses those particles together. Then material jetting is kind of a mix where you would infuse particles inside of a liquid that you're doing. This could be really fine details or exotic materials um, that some companies are doing that these days. So FDM or FFF, um, this is standardly what you would find at your house. Uh, most common uh, 3D printing, when you open your box, you can print materials like PLA, PETG, TPU, um, kind of right out of the box most of the time. Composite printing, that's going to be, um, you hear a lot of teams talking about, they have a Mark Forge and they reinforce parts with a continuous strand carbon fiber, continuous strand fiberglass. That's going to be the process that, that um, they're talking about. Desktop metal is a kind of a new player in this segment. They use a, a tape process that is um, slightly different. It's kind of rolled on in between the parts. The definition isn't quite as good, but it's um, a new technology in that realm. And then metal printing, you have filament based, which is basically like a spool of PLA, but it's a, it's a metal. And then you have a paste base, which is uh, kind of what uh, Rapida does which is kind of in cartridges, which is a, a water-based solution, and then rod-based, which is what desktop metal uses. And they kind of force those rods with heat through an extruder um, versus having a continuous strand of filament. The last time under uh, powder bed fusion, so we have a SLS or selective laser sintering. Um, there's a picture of a SLS machine to your right here that I run at, um, run at my office, and then a DMLS part on the bottom. The, the powder-based systems are gonna run off to the simple concept that you have a vat that keeps your good powder and then a, a build platform that as one rises, the other lowers and there's a wiper that goes across the, uh, across the platforms that spreads a layer of powder. This can be anywhere from 25 microns up to 200 microns. Um, very similar to how you would slice a, a standard print, but instead of the, the Z height changing um, to extrude either more or less material, um, you're just changing how much of the powder that you spread across to then have a laser come over top of and center it and uh, form it into your solid part. Um, these have a lot more degrees of freedom as far as the cosmetics of a part. Um, they can be supported a lot better and maintain structural integrity. Um, you can get complex geometries with the DMLS that you can't get in some other, some other fashions of printing. Under VAT polymerization, so this is a Nexa 3 printer. It's a uh, one of the world's fastest printers, Nexa and Carbon, are going back and forth right now. Um, and this is a, a robot part that uh, is kind of a counter roller that we used this year. Um, this is a part that is done uh, in an hour and 15 minute print time. It's about seven inches tall, so it's a fairly large part. This is a process um, that is DLP based, and so it projects that single image. So every slice layer, they do a cross section of the part, and that is what's um, projected onto under the build plate from the resin and that's how it's able to print so fast. Where SLA is the more traditional, it's been around for a very long time, but it uses a laser tracing or sometimes two laser tracers and they trace the, the body of the part. But obviously there's a, a lot more ground to, to make up when you have a single point laser versus a entire projection. You could think of it like a TV screen that was flashing an image of your part at a certain cross section per print. Binder jetting printing. So this is the most exciting for me. This is a new process that, uh, that I've been working on myself. Um, th these have multiple players in the game. Some plastic is the HP multi-jet fusion. So this is um, a powder bed fusion method, but it's a, it's a binder jet process. This is um, kind of replacing a lot of SLS um, machines uh, for, new um, for new customers uh, who may be adopting it. Um, it's fast, there's also a large build area, and it's not quite as expensive to run compared to some of the traditional SLS. The part quality is extremely good, but part density, which is really important for material characteristics, is 
a lot higher than what it generally would be. Um, this get, lends to a larger build blocks, infinite geometries. And they have uh, PA6s, PA11s, PA12 nylons, and you have TPUs that are coming out as well. Now they have polypropylenes, which is if you had a deck chair or anything like that, a lot of industrial uses in the polypropylene segment. Now metal printing, this is digital metal, desktop metal, HP, GE, X1. Those are the, the main players. The only one that really has a, a unit out in the open is digital metal. That's a, that's a machine that we have at, at Azoff that I run every day. Um, the desktop metal has a couple beta machines out, much larger, um, slightly different process, but the digital metal machine is what you'll see up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, it's a process that has one gantry that spreads powder, then a second gantry that spreads a binder. Ours is an organic binder. You could think of it like a glue. So we're, we're spreading a powder, then we're gluing it together with a binder. This holds it into what we call a green state. Then after that green state, this still has to go through multiple process to actually form into a solid metal part. So for your team, why additive, manufa why additive manufacturing? So accessibility is better than it ever has been. You can now buy a Ender 3, let's say, and you can have a price point of $230. Maybe you upgrade a nozzle, get a roll of filament, and maybe you're a little under $300. But most teams have a budget for new tools or things like that, that maybe they're buying a new drill or new bandsaw. I'm trying to tell you that you should probably invest in a 3D printer if you don't have one. We'll get into a later on of what are the capabilities and why you would want to. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good investment for most teams. There's a lot of teams that ha have them, and I think the adoption is growing every day. Um, free machine time. So yes, it still takes time, but there doesn't have to be an operator right next to the, to the printer. If you guys are leaving the shop at nine o'clock at night, you can start the print or start a series of prints, and those are ready when you get in, in the morning time. You can kind of not have as much wasted time in your schedule. Exposure for students. So as far as industry, um, I'm in it every day. So if you're an FRC mentor listening to this right now, or you're a student, you, you either need to push your coaches to, to do more additive, or if you're, a, if you're a coach or a mentor on a team, you need to push, push your students to, to dive into this technology a little bit more. It's, uh, it's only grown in the ind industrial segment for prototyping, end use components, some of the printing processes today, the, the detail, the part density, and the speed of manufacturing is severely increasing um, at an alarming rate. And so this is something that anybody should be jumping into right now and uh, kind of getting a hold on the market. Uh, faster part ability for FRC teams. So if you need certain parts that it might take three days shipping from a supplier, but you can print that same part in four hours, this is where that would come into play. And then extremely quick prototypes. If you have five to 10 printers, you can prototype an entire mechanism in a day um, and have a very quick turnaround time, which is in the early seasons, the first couple of weeks, um, this is huge for teams. So, so how, how do we in, in industry use additive manufacturing 3D printing? So we have mold. So the upper left is a, is a mold cavity piece that we use um, on a urethane. The middle is a work holding that we use for a customer that um, needs to manage their arbors. The upper right hand corner is going to be a work holding piece for an assembly jig on a major OEM automotive um, assembly line. The bottom left is a, uh, is a gripper. So this is for a tier one supplier. These are part grippers that go on the end of robots and uh, manipulate parts. And then the bottom middle is, those are for a medical industry for medical machines that are in almost every hospital in the US. So these are just some of the markets that, that we use every day. You can see it goes from end use components to prototype components to tool storage that is on a bench that maybe no one thought of, but that blocked a 3D print. Um, we didn't have a machine set up time for it like you would on CNC and we're able to part mark or put ink right into the part um, to put a logo on it, to put the sizing right on it. That didn't have to be etched in. It doesn't wear away. It's underneath the layers of material. How you can bring this to FRC. So I would recommend that every team start simple. This is going to be simple parts that don't require a lot of support. Maybe it's a pulley, but you take the, the side flanges off and then you print those on a separate print. This allows you to not have support material. It's faster. You'll have better reliability, a much better surface finish, which can be important. I know that there's quite a few people who will start 3D printing and the parts just don't look quite, quite what they expected. And they might have a lot of support. The density of supports wasn't there. A lot of factors that play into it. 
um, you can really increase your increase your adoption rate if you have a really good experience the first time doing it. And that comes to kind of setting yourself up for success. That's a bit a big thing for us and on our teams that uh, that we preach is doing simple parts first before we get complex. Um, now the bottom left is a more complex part. This is the SLS part that was on a robot. Um, these are parts that um, maybe not every team has. Um, every team doesn't have a $100,000 SLS printer, but there's companies like Formlabs who now have their Fuse One. This is now a sub $20,000 printer all in. Um, and now that's starting to get a lot more affordable for teams to do complex geometries parts. Um, tool storage and organization around your shop. If you're making assembly fixtures or soft jaws for machining, you want to store these somewhere, or you have a toolbox and you want to have a, you know, your go-to tools that you need every time. This might be a couple rivets, a couple fasteners, maybe a 3 16 um, whatever it is, um, you guys can ha have it kind of on hand. And then spirit items. I included a full color print that we did at work. This is a, a small Bowser. It's a fun picture to include, but this could be any giveaways, trophies that you guys do. Um, this particular model was um, is an FDM process, but uh, this printer has um, inkjets affixed to it, so we can do full color 3D printing. Um, thought that was something cool to add. So the common materials for FRC, everybody should start out with PLA. I don't care if you have a lot of experience, your team's been doing 3D printing for a while. There's so many uses for PLA, or I'll even throw tough PLA in this that, um, can be used. These are guards that you can see, guards for a SWERB module. This can be um, from getting material, carpet, grease out of the module, kind of shields the gears. Then you have a, an implant that you use for a, um, for a wheel. Now, these are just some examples. You have tons of sensor covers, tons of mounts. Um, on our team, I know that we probably did 50% of our parts were a tough PLA. Um, and it was just using some of the techniques that we're going to talk about to properly um, properly uh, picking material for these parts and, and not kind of going way off the board with it. Another one that's commonly used is nylon. So you can see on the right, there's a, a set of swerve drive modules that have an entire nylon base and there's pulleys that were dyed green. Some of the benefits of the nylon is that after the SLS process, you can, you can dye these, um, the, the white powder to the, to the color you want, but these are custom pulleys, custom end caps, and um, custom sw uh, swerve encoder gears. Um, these are things that, although these are SLS, they also make an FDM nylon um, or carbon infused nylons that we'll get to on the next slide, which falls under embedded materials. So these are super common. Lots of teams are kind of adopting the Mark Forge um, machines, but there's other other materials. We've been doing some work at Design Flow to release this summer for um, kind of a setup for teams that maybe have Ender printers or other artillery printers. Maybe don't have quite the budget. How do we print? Um, how do we print good parts um, that maybe I'll, I'll say look like and, and function like a like in uh, a Mark Forge part or a nylon with chop with chopped carbon fiber inside of it. So if you look here, we have three examples. Um, two of them are Mark Forge and one is a carbon PETG that, um, that we did. That's on the right. Uh, Mark Forge is in the middle and then a swerve drive module is on the left. This is an early pro uh, prototype they did. Now I want to focus on the middle here because I think there's a common misconception that uh, everything has to be just additive or just subtractive. This is a really good example that we use for a, um, a custom pulley application on, uh, on my team, uh, 3542. This is where we kind of call it a hybrid part. We mixed a little bit of additive and a little bit of our um, CNC subtractive capabilities to come up with custom pulleys. This was for um, a four bar lift for uh, climbing. This was 20, 2018, 2019, sorry. Uh, so um, the, everything doesn't have to be just by itself. There's lots of applications that it could be a completely aluminum 6061 machine gearbox, but maybe your spacers, your end plate or your end cap could be a 3D printed part. Um, they don't have to be just one by themselves. These definitely can be parts that coexist next to each other in assemblies. So a lot of the machines that uh, Ronnie's talked about earlier in this presentation are industry level or, or uh, really high quality expensive machinery that, that big companies like uh, Ford would run out or, or something like that. 
Uh, but what we're trying to emphasize here and, and what we're getting into is that to achieve the same results as you saw earlier in the, in the past couple of slides, you don't need to go spend 3,000, 3,500, 15 grand on a, on a 3D printer. Um, specifically for PLA, PETG, nylon, or carbon fiber embedded nylon. Um, a lot of these printers that you see here is like under $500. The Artillery Genius is actually a new printer that's actually pretty good. Um, I have three of them running almost next to me right now. Um, they're, uh, they're easy to start. They have a volcano nozzle. They're um, pretty hands-free hands in terms of maintenance. Um, and they're, they produce excellent result for PLA or PETG. And then the Ender 3 below that one um, on the left is a, uh, is a pretty common printer. I think it's like the number one uh, used printer right now for the United States. Um, it has a huge user following. So there's lots of uh, aftermarket prints for it to upgrade it. Um, it's, it works great out of the box. Um, and, and a lot of people that I know are using this for, uh, for FRC parts. Um, and then you have some some big players that outside of the Mark Forger on the right here. Uh, the Prusa is a really good printer that's that's almost perfect out of the box for printing uh, a lot of the FRC parts. And then the Ender 5 Plus below that. Uh, the other three printers in this in this diagram are about an eight and a half inch build volume, but the Ender 5 Plus is a 13 inch, and that really increases your capabilities. So for nylon or embedded materials, uh, the printers on the left here are pretty end use, uh, ready to go for if you wanted to just load in carbon fiber or embedded material or nylon or, or something like that. Very easy, free of use. But again, the price tags are uh, you know, 5,500 for the top uh, Ultimaker or 2,500 for the TAS below it. Um, there's actually a company called Micro Swiss that's based here in the US that makes all metal hot ends or wear resistant nozzles, um, those kind of things to be able to upgrade those lower end printers um, easily. Uh, they're direct swap-ins to be able to then use, use uh, nylon or embedded materials. Um, so this could easily be a stepping stone in, in for teams. Uh, if, you have a, if you're a low budget uh, team and you only have 200, $300 to spend, um, it's very easy to get an Ender 3 or an Artillery Genius or something along those lines and start printing PLA right away and start seeing improvements. And then in a year or two, making those upgrades. Um, and then in, uh, once you understand um, how to print and uh, how to print quality uh, end use parts, uh, investing in, in your uh, machines and then uh, printing nylon or embedded materials. The second piece outside of the hardware is gonna be software. You're gonna need a slicer that's able to convert the 3D model that you put in into G-code. Um, Ultimaker, Cura, and Prusa Slicer are very uh, user-friendly. Uh, they have different modes inside them for easy use or advanced users. Uh, they support multiple different materials. They do automatic slicing for you based off of pre-configured um, slicer settings. Um, and then Simplify 3D is a pretty common, widely used slicer program, but it is a uh, a cost basis. I think it's a discounted for students, um, probably for education discounts and things like that. But you will need one of these softwares to download and they're very easy to work with. So on top of those two things, you're going to need some kind of basic knowledge on what you're doing within the slicer. Um, so we'll run through a couple of quick uh, settings that, you, that you'll probably touch or play with to try and get quality end use parts out of your prints, regardless of the material. So the first one will be infill density. Um, that's just basically the amount of material inside the part, inside the walls. So in the pictures below, you'll see like the cross hatching or the triangles, that's your infill. Um, you can fill the part as much as you want, but you start to see diminishing strength returns for versus part weight or material usage right around like the 50% mark. As you can see, like the 10 to 30%, those, that's a very drastic improvement and it's even pretty noticeable from the 30 to 50%. But from the 50 to 90% there, there's not a whole lot that you gain in terms of strength or lattice, um, but you will increase part cost and, uh, and weight. So then there's different types of infill. This is just a basic kind of uh, run through. There's grid or rectangular, which is the most common, probably the default setting in your slicer. Um, it's the fastest because the nozzle only has to track uh, in sweeps in one direction. Um, it's very low complexity. It doesn't necessarily offer the best strength though. The triangular uh, normally is an easy swap. It does offer quite a bit of strength in different directions of part loads. Um, it's most strong if it's perpendicular into uh, the Z direction, which means the direction that you're printing in. 
Um, then there's cubic subdivision. This is actually a three-dimensional infill. It prints basically little pyramids inside the park, uh, moves them around a whole lot. Um, it is a drastically slower print compared to the two above it, um, but it is stronger in all directions comparatively to triangular, which is only stronger perpendicularly. And then concentric. Concentric is really used for flexible filaments. It uh, maintains the flexibility of the material um, after the part is finished printing. So then for layer height, what layer height is, is a uh, 3D printer works by extruding material onto a build plate layer by layer. So the layer height is the thickness of that layer. It's normally measured in microns, which is 0 0.001 millimeters. Uh, typical layer height is one or, or yeah, one fifteen or one point, what is it? One millimeter or uh, 100 micron, 150 micron or 200 micron. Sorry, that's what I meant. Which is 0 0.1, 0 0.15 or 0 0.2 millimeter. Um, and this, this is kind of where your trade-off starts to begin in, uh, in print finish and your speed and the functionality of the part. So this chart provided kind of shows that um, if you want a really strong part, hit 100% infill. Um, and then if you want, you know, everything, probably about a 70% infill and a 0.2 milliliter layer height. Then your line width. Not a lot of people normally mess with line width, but this is actually something that can probably help you out. Uh, the line width is this is the width of the line that a single ex, uh, extrusion passes by, like a, uh, how much, how width, why the line is as the plastic flows out of the nozzle onto the build plate. Um, it's a function of the nozzle size. So normally you have a 0.4 millimeter nozzle um, that could be a 0.6 or 0.25, anything like that. But normally it's a percentage value of what that nozzle size is. Um, as shown in this chart here, 140% of nozzle size is pretty optimal for strength of part, but it does tend to decrease the quality of surface finish of, uh, of the end use part. Um, but it is one of the better ways to increase strength in a part other than infill. Um, so not a lot of people use this, but um, it's the key to, to try and get stronger parts. Another thing is wall thickness. So before the infill starts, the 3D printer will run a wall around the outside portion of your part. Um, it can be however thick, however many layers deep that you want it to be. Um, but normally this is another parameter included with the line uh, width that will increase the part strength greater than increasing infill will. Or you'll see more value for weight or material usage out of increasing those two parameters than, uh, than infill. So, like shown, 100% uh, infill with a two perimeter um, is not very strong comparatively to 133% line width with three perimeters um, or 100% line width with four perimeters or 200% with two perimeters. Um, so if you only run two perimeter lines, but you do it at 200% uh, line width, it's significantly stronger than 100%. So it's just something to use. Um, then print speed. Print speed is directly related to your print, your uh, finish quality, how fast you print the, uh, the part. It's the movement speed of the print head. Normally for PLA, you can run anywhere between 30 and 70 millimeters per second. It's pretty forgiving when it prints, uh, but for things like nylon or a PT, PETG, things like that, you normally want to stick around the 30 to 40 millimeter per second range. Um, the, the graphic kind of shows you like what'll happen when you start creeping up on those boundaries, it will, uh, it will drastically increase or decrease your uh, production time. So you'll get a part faster off. Um, could be useful for like, if you wanna just physically see something in, in your hand instead of CAD and you're not actually gonna use it. Um, but you'll generally wanna stay in, in the regions uh, where we'll show you in a minute. Then retraction. Retraction speed is how fast the um, filament is pulled back through the hot end. Um, and then travel is how far it's pulled back to the knot end, hot end. So these settings uh, deal with the stringiness of the material, the plastic, as you see on the right versus the left. Um, and tuning these can help you reduce uh, that stringiness with, or, or get a better surface quality or anything uh, on your parts. Uh, normally you wanna stay between 0.5 millimeters and three millimeters on, um, on your retraction distance. And it's normally roughly around the same speed or half the speed of your um, of your print speed. And support material. Anything with overhangs that are greater than 45 degrees will want to print with support material. 
um, as you can see in the T. Support material is helpful for getting a stronger part with overhangs, but if you can design for 3D printing and try and minimize those overhangs, you'll have a, a higher quality part. Um, the denser the supports you use, the harder they're gonna be to remove, but the more quality of layers you'll have on top of those um, supports, but the lower the density, the, uh, the lower material you waste for print and the easier you're able to get them off. Um, 30% and 45% or 30 degree and 45 degree overhangs are normally uh, good to stick around with. Uh, 60 degrees, it's gonna, the slicer is gonna start putting uh, uh, support material in. So then bed adhesion. Uh, there's a lot of different materials you can print with and they all adhere to the bed differently. Um, this may, and, and based on your part geometry, it may require you to have some kind of uh, extra bed adhesion property like a raft. A raft is good for really, really small cross-sectional parts when you're printing uh, because you want them to stick to the, uh, the print bed throughout the whole duration of the print. A skirt will help eliminate the, uh, the oozing or the little bits of uh, plastic that come out of the nozzle when you first initially start a print. It can help you get a, a solid first layer of, for your print and uh, get you a good foundation to start on. And then a brim is kind of like a raft, but it's directly attached to the part. So you'll have to peel it off kind of like support material after, but it will help uh, adhere that uh, part to the bed for the duration of the print. So if you have like a really tall spacer or something like that, but it's you know only half inch diameter, um, it might be useful to include a brim on the, on the print so that it doesn't fail seven hours into your whatever tall spacer you're printing. Um, and then just peel it off at the end. So a couple of good starting points for prints. PLA is extremely forgiving with 3D printing and normally adheres to whatever you put on the build surface. But what's, what's pretty good to start with is glass. Um, most 3D printers now have an ultra base type of, of bed and uh, which is like a perforated glass material, which is very good out of the box for printing PLA. Um, most materials manufacturers will provide you a recommended temperature setting for their material. Um, PLA is normally somewhere from 190 to 220. Um, the bed temperature is normally 45 to 60, somewhere in that range. Um, and like I said before, you can print up to 70 millimeters per second with this, um, and the retraction di distance is about 0.5 to 1 millimeters. Um, it's very good when you first get a material to run what's called a temperature tower. So a temperature tower is something that you put in your slicer settings where it changes the temperature of the hot end nozzle from a certain temperature to the end temperature um, throughout like at different level uh, layers during the print. So you'll start printing this tower at like 190 degrees C and then increment by five degrees C every 20 or 30 layers. Um, it takes about an hour to print, but then when it, once it's done, you can see what that material provides the best uh, surface quality finish at. So. It might be that one material that you get or one spool material is like really good at 195, but another one requires 210 to print. It's just something easy to check, um, to start with. Another common material is PETG. We haven't quite talked about it a whole lot in this presentation. The deal with PETG is it's, it's cheaper than nylon and more durable than PLA, but it's really stringy. It's kind of more difficult to print with. That being said, you can produce some pretty good parts out of this material if you have some experience with doing it and you do some trial and error and testing your retraction settings and your print speeds. Um, normally for this material, you wanna be around the 230 to 250 degrees C range with a bed temp much higher of 75 and 90 degrees. Um, this is one of those finicky materials where it doesn't really like glass. It likes to be on glue stick or painter's tape which normally means you can take like an Elmer's PV, PVA glue stick and just run it across your um, uh, build plate, one or two quick layers of that and it, it won't peel up on you. Um, print speed is normally about 45 is I think what we stick to for millimeters per second. Um, and a re your retraction has gotta be a, a lot bigger than PLA because of the stringiness of the material. Um, if you're running a direct drive setup instead of a Bowden setup, which, uh, a direct drive just means the extruder is directly on the hot end and a bowed in is where you see the tube that comes off the hot end over to the side of the printer uh, where the extruder is located. Um, direct drive normally has to be lower in extract uh, retraction rates. So nylon, nylon is one of those complex materials that's kind of harder to print. You want to have an all metal hot end kit. Um, you want to have 
some kind of material as, as your nozzle that's not going to wear easy. Um, something like uh, steel, hardened steel is what we use, A2 hardened steel or tool steel. Um, with an extruder temp of anywhere up to 265. I think most of them run in like the 250 degree C range. The bed temp is normally likes to be closer to 90 than 70. Um, and you really wanna have a Garolite or PE build surface for this. Garolite is what we would recommend. It, it, it has a, a beautiful surface finish at the, on the bottom of the part and it adheres really, really nicely to it. Um, we print all of our nylon at around 30 to 35 millimeters per second. It seems slow. Um, but it's worth it in the end. You get a really good finished part. And then your attraction differences, distance is, is relatively the same as a PETG. So for embedded materials, on the left is the nylon and on the right is the PETG. Most of them are pretty similar to their, uh, their non-embedded counterparts. Um, you're gonna wanna have the same um, type of settings. The only difference is like with the PETG embedded, you're gonna wanna run even slower than you would run normal PETG. Um, and for both of these materials, because there are chopped bits of carbon or glass or something embedded in the material, you're, it helps to have a larger nozzle size. So that 0.6 millimeter nozzle size is gonna help you out a lot. Um, and then a little bit of design considerations uh, when we're rolling through this. So layer orientation is important to the strength of your part. So the lay the bonding between the layers is the weakness in a 3d print so if you if you apply tension against that bonding of the layers that's where your part is weak but if you apply tension um, where the part is is pulling against fibers of plastic not the adhesion between the layers then you have a strong part the opposite is true for impact if you impact a 3d print along those layer lines it'll probably shear along the layer line but if you, put, if you impact it uh, down in the Z direction, it's a pretty strong part. Um, and the top face generally has the best surface finish. Um, you can tune the, uh, the sides to, to come out very well with, uh, with your layer height and your print speed. Um, but it's just something to note when you're putting something on your print bed in your slicer that you'll want to lay it flat on a, to, to try and minimize supports. But then the top layer is probably what's going to look the best in the end of the day. Then infill and wall thickness. So increasing your infill does increase strength, but it also increases your weight. So the orange line showed here is with just increasing wall thickness and the blue line is just increasing infill. So as you can see, um, the strength of your part versus your weight for different set points is significant. Um, this was done in tensile testing. So your results might be slightly different during um, during impact or, or some kind of fatigue test. Um, but this is normally what, what we base our prints off of. Um, if you need strength in a part, our infill is normally around, you know, 40 to 55 percent, but we increase the wall thickness or your line width to get the strength out of the part without using all the material. The stress risers. So Fillets and chamfers help out a lot when you're designing. Um, a print head can move on a constant speed when it's doing a fillet um, on the XY plane uh, versus a sharp edge. This helps the layers adhere better when the print head's not jolting around all the time. And when you have a stress concentration on a layer line, it produces a very weak print. Uh, we found this out in some of our swerve forks and had to redesign them to try and include um, fit large fillets or, or combine them with, uh, with sandwiching them with bolts, sandwiching the layers with bolts and things like that. So it's important to understand that uh, when you're designing parts that are meant to be printed, you should try and eliminate any direct um, corners or uh, try and mesh those corners nicer. And then shrinkage. So when the plastic transitions from a liquid state to a solid state, the part will shrink. Um, now, most of the time that's negligible, but it is something to consider if you're doing a part that has to be super precise. Um, nylon has got the greatest shrink rate, that be it, it's only 1.5%, but it is something to uh, consider when you're printing like um, something that, that is going to be tapped or have a threaded insert put into it or um, something that's for a dowel 
um, something that's supposed to be tight tolerance. Um, it's it's nice to have that designed in when you begin and not have to be drilling out your 3D prints or something like that at, at, at the end use. Most of the time, PLA and PETG will be pretty close true to form. So you don't necessarily have to do those types of things to them. And then working with inserts. So we almost, there's very few circumstances where we intend to directly tap the plastic of a 3D print. Um, it's not necessarily the strongest way to be able to do that because you are dealing with those layers again. Um, so if you shear that bolt right out, you probably ruin your 3D print. So the way that we normally deal with something that has to be tapped is, is with a threaded insert. Um, those come in two different types. Um, of course, both of them are sold by McMaster. So they're screw to expand inserts and then tapered heat set inserts. Um, both of them need designs a little bit differently. The screw to expand inserts are just a straight hole through your design. And then when you screw the bolt or the, or the screw into it, uh, the knurling expands and embeds itself into the plastic of the part. Um, and it becomes very hard to rip that thread out of the plastic. Uh, for a heat set insert, uh, there's normally a taper in the hole and you push that against, push the insert against the taper. And then you use a soldering iron to melt the uh, insert into the printed part. So this will, um, there, there's tips and tricks. Like if you throw a insert the opposite direction than what you think it would work in your mind, it actually pulls against the taper when you bolt it down and creates a stronger joint. Um, that's something that Mark Forge uh, advertises and, and it does create a, a stronger parts. So I think that's about all that we have for this presentation. Um, we're about 15 minutes out of our time. So we'd like to save that for Q&A um, if there are any questions in the chat or anything like that. Hopefully we're able to, to ease your problems with 3D printing and, and get you guys going. Uh, feel free to contact either of us as well um, through the 503 website or, or through uh, Speed or through Design Flow or through any of these uh, areas. Chief Delphi, we'll, we'd be glad to help you guys out if you have any problems at any point. Um, so, all righty. Thank you guys so much for that um, interesting uh, presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions from the chat. Um, I will just go ahead and pull that up. Um, the first one is how much is uh, additive manufacturing used in FRC today? And where do you see that going within you know, the next five years? Uh, so I guess I'll start on this one. Um, I can't speak for every team, uh, but what I can do is I can speak for teams that I, um, I mentor on directly and then people that I talk to or other mentors in the industry um, that we help um, and other teams that my work sponsors. So um, for us on speed, I would say that of our robot um, complete assemblies, I would say upwards of 40 40 to 45% of our robot was printed components. Uh, this year is probably the most extreme. Um, we're a team that's fortunate enough to have a, um, a CNC in-house and, and other um, manufacturing abilities, but uh, 3D printing has really helped us to make our robots lighter overall um, in uh, kind of new geometries. Um, and then also changed uh, densities on pulleys and in gears and things like that. We did um, shooter hoods, things that are, I guess, generally harder to machine or take a little bit, uh, take a little bit more personnel or, or individual time. Uh, we transferred those over to additive manufacturing. Um, we don't have a huge team. So if you don't have a huge team, but maybe you have resources to buy printers, it's a really good way to, uh, to free up resources, a human resource uh, to maybe better use on your CNC side or subtract, uh, subtractive side programming. There's lots of facets to, to first and kind of offload some of those tasks onto a, th a 3D printer. I think this number is going to, to continually grow. There's more and more teams posting questions on Chief, um, reaching out to us, asking for help printing certain materials. Um, I, I would say by 2023, I would say that almost every team has one. Maybe we'll get to the point where um, a, a major manufacturer comes on board and donates um, Creality printers or at least um, vouchers to go buy printers as a team. Awesome. Yeah. Um, pretty sorry. Similar on our, sorry. It's pretty similar on our side as well. We have a large team uh, on the opposite end, and we feel like additive manufacturing has definitely helped us in the prototype phase. 
Um, we've been making scale models, quick prototypes, different things for our shooter. Um, I mean, we had full gearboxes built like day three um, this year for our shooter uh, with hood and, and different capabilities on it, which was awesome. Like our team has never seen that before. And it became, uh, became prominent when we started experimenting with this stuff in the off season. Awesome. Awesome. Um, obviously, you guys mentioned um, a couple of different materials. Um, what type of 3D printer do you, do you recommend for maybe uh, PLA versus uh, T, uh, TPU? Um, so for TPU, you're going to want to direct drive more than PLA. Pretty much any printer that you get, you'll, you'll be able to run PLA pretty well on. Um, it's just going to be your ease of use. Uh, TPU is kind of finicky. You want something with a higher flow rate and you want something that's able to retract the material without it going through a Bowden tube. So you're really going to want to look for a direct drive product. So if you're in the thousand dollar range or less then the Prusa is a really good printer for it. Or if you're in the $500 range then the Artillery Genius is a, is a direct drive printer. Um, if you have an Ender product now or a Creality product now, then there are kits out there that'll get you a direct drive. Um, we don't normally cover TPU because um, it's not a widely used material in FRC. Um, there's some talk about teams wanting to use it to, to make their own timing belts, and it just doesn't really held up, hold up to the, uh, to the standard of the competition. So, um, Yeah, I can attest to that one. Um, <laughs> then just uh, as far as price point, um, if you have a little bit more money to spend, and like Zach was talking about, some e the easeability, um, you know, sometimes you get mesh bed leveling or um, companies are using BL Touch or other sensors um, for better bed leveling. And so sometimes that's a big deal for a team that, um, that they want to just be able to kind of more so click a button and then start a print. And other teams kind of want to have the aspect of they want to upgrade it. They want to have the ability to kind of add things onto their printer and more tailor it to their team's needs. Um, this is where sometimes it's nice to, to have an FRC team that maybe has a, a couple of each, maybe they're their workhorse or they start out with something um, like they have an Ultimaker donated um, or they have a Taz, uh, a Prusa, um, other printers out there on the market. Um, and then maybe they get into, they're like, want to do more polymer printing, don't want to invest $4,000 now into a, um, a Mark one. They look at something like a, Creality and then do a direct drive and all metal hot end from Micro Swiss and then change their bed material or adhere a Garolite surface to that. Um, and those are pretty sound um, out of the box with upgrades on them to be able to print those materials. Um, for just speaking, we're going to be releasing to the public on Chief later this summer. We've been doing quite a lot of experimenting and tons and tons of testing and printing with um, carbon filled materials. And so we're going to release some settings and some recommendations printed and such. So look out for that. Um, this summer for your team to be able to kind of read the PDF and have a little bit better idea of what you can um, print with. The whole goal of it has been to as little resources as possible um, with the best parts. Our benchmark have been Mark Forge parts. We, um, we each have Mark Forges and we print on them daily as well. So we, we know the quality and where we use those parts. So that's been the benchmark for teams that don't have a Mark Forge or they can't get five Mark Forges. So they need to be able to have that solution on, uh, on other lower end printers to be able to print similar quality parts. So I guess uh, you also tied it to actually another question um, we got, which was, um, would you recommend a uh, fleet of uh, che cheaper printers like um, Ender 3s or maybe like a, a lower amount, like one or two of um, maybe more high end printers like um, Mark Forges, like you mentioned? Yeah, so the deal with a, with a cheaper printer is you wanna understand what's going on with the printer. Uh, the reason that the MarkForge price tag is so high is it's, it's a complete end use thing. You just press a button and you go and you get a high quality part at the end of the day. If you're willing to invest the time into it for significantly lower um, money, you can, you can get high quality results off of a, um, off of a lower end printer. Um, but in terms of printing, the uh, the print time is kind of the the choke point of a lot of a lot of production. Um, so having more is always what I kind of like to lean towards. So if I'm going to buy a Mark Forge at this point, I'm probably not, and I'm probably going to go use that same money and buy four or five lower ones because I can run, you know, five times the parts on that than I can on a Mark Forge. Yeah, I would go similar with. Uh with Zach on this point. Um, I said earlier in the presentation, I'm a huge proponent that um, 
I, I do think that teams are now that we're getting Mark Forges, our team has fell um, victim to this is that we, the Mark Forge is so nice and they look so good that we just use it for everything. Um, we're lucky enough to have access to multiple of them, but a lot of teams aren't. Um, and they can quickly be overloaded with parts. I've heard many stories of teams, high level teams that um, have overbooked their printers by hours and hours um, on Mark Forges. <laughs> Um, so this is definitely, definitely an issue. Um, but quick prototype parts don't need to be Mark Forges. When you're doing the first four weeks, Onyx is not cheap. $200 a roll, I think 180 is, is educational pricing. It's not, it's not something that's super cheap to just blow through and then plus you have a, a print speed of 25 to 35 millimeters per second versus running PLA at, at upwards of 70 for quick prototypes. It's not the answer that that person probably wants to hear, but you need both. Um, <laughs> So my perfect solution would be to have one Mark Forge that you use for your end use components and stuff that, go, that goes on the robot that you can space those out over a little bit more time. But I would not be scared to have um, a fleet of five or five to 10 Delta Minis or Ender 3s that run pulleys and in, in low load applications, tons of prototype parts. Um, there's so much, uh, so much area for use of, of tough PLA, PLA, PTG. Um, that, that, that I, don't, I don't think every team needs a Mark Forge. It's nice to have. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot online that says, hey, go buy a Mark Forge. But um, I like them, but it's not, every team doesn't need to buy one, I don't think, right, uh, right off the bat. And materials are getting better um, to the fact that, and printers are getting better at the price point. You can get a printer that prints almost all materials or within a couple hundred bucks of upgrades um, to be able to print these materials and not have to spend $4,000, so. Um, so obviously 3d printing is very versatile and, um, so, you know, a lot of cool things can be made from it. So, um, a question we got was, uh, what was the coolest thing or like the favorite, the thing that, you know, you made that you like the most or like the favorite thing that you made or like a part or, or maybe like a, like an entire, uh, yeah, like an entire, um, thing, Some, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I think probably is next to gra grab something. I'm sitting here. <laughs> yeah, so we actually went through the process on, on Frog Force of, of older molding, over molding silicone and urethane onto uh, 3D printed parts. Um, so one of the wheels that we showed earlier in the presentation is actually a PLA hub that we over molded silicone onto for an intake wheel because we thought that silicone gripped the totes better. Um, and we didn't have the money to go out and buy a super expensive Fairlane wheel. So we ended up buying the stuff for like 30 or 40 bucks off of Amazon to mix our own silicone. And then we printed a hub for maybe, you know, a dollar of material cost and then over molded the silicone onto it. And that was probably the coolest thing that I've, I've seen on a robot. Outside of being on a robot, we ran a lot of Swerve uh, stuff where, where we saw, mainly because Strikeforce was doing it, we thought it was super cool, is they were over molding their wheels, um, which were Mark Forge. So we did a lot of like Mark Forge stuff with tread patterns. And then we, we would print a tread pattern in PLA and then do a mold of it and then cast that tread pattern in urethane with a key in it so that we could attach it to a Mark Forge part. Um, and that, that kind of stuff I get really geeky about outside of um, like rack and pinions and, and stuff like that. Yep. So for us, I have two, two parts to it. These will be my industrial examples. Oh man, it's not going to show up very well. I don't know, maybe that shows up better. So this is a, a metal part. Uh, these are just cool models that, uh, th that I've done at work or in the office. Um, these are for a, a game board piece um, out of 316L. Um, and then these are kind of a, a, just a fidget cube, but it's a full color 3D printing. So I'm able to put um, logos and things like that on it. Now for a robot, um, this year we kind of did our entire shooter assembly, um, turret pieces, large, large turret gear. We had a, uh, our, our meter wheel, we were able to do kind of custom. Similar to this concept is that we're able to um, combine different pitches and, and different profiles and uh, sizing of pulleys um, onto one assembly. So we cut our part count down by like 32 parts by redesigning all for additive. Um, originally we were like, oh, this definitely um, is gonna have a lot of load on it, a lot of power on it. We probably don't wanna do this additive. It's an important part of the game. Um, and so we ended up uh, kind of switching that philosophy and ended up sa saving weight in about 20 some pieces by switching over to an additive concept. So that's the coolest part for me is simplifying mechanisms, combining assemblies that 
too hard for us to machine or not economical for us to machine in house um, over to a machine that has a little bit more control over infinite geometries. Well, I think that is, um, yeah, that is uh, it from our um, online uh, chat section. Um, thank you guys so much for that um, very interesting presentation. Um, it's very cool what you showed us. And uh, yeah, have a nice rest of y'all's day. Absolutely. You guys too. Thanks everyone for tuning in.